They became best friends. They studied together. They helped each other out financially. Uh, if a, one of them got in a pinch, uh, the other one stood by them through thick and thin. It doesn't matter. When they graduated from seminary, both of them, just a coincident, received a church uh, call, a call from a church saying, hey, we'd like for you to come be our pastor. And the, they both ended up in the same state, the state of Louisiana. Bob got a church in the northern part of the state. Bill got a church uh, in the south part of the state, and life was great. Every Wednesday, they would meet up together uh, somewhere in the middle of the state, and they would hunt together and fish together and look for gators and go out just shooting guns. And they did that for many years. They started getting close to retirement, and one day Pastor Bill said to Pastor Bob, I, I think... Uh, uh, about this for a long time. There's no one else I would rather do my funeral than you. Pastor Bob said to Bill, well, I feel the same way. I can't think of anyone better than you to do my funeral. So they agreed that whoever died first would do the other one's funeral, and it came to pass that Pastor Bob passed away first. Pastor Bill went up north to his church. Of course, they didn't visit each other's churches. That's one thing pastors can't do. I have a, a cousin that's a preacher and a brother-in-law that was a preacher, and I, I never heard him preach other than a couple of times uh, my brother-in-law preached here because we we're always in our church, and the same was true for them. So he went up to the church, and of course he met one of the church ladies. Uh, all church has them. This is no slam on anybody here. Okay, but y'all know what church ladies are, and uh, her name was Evelyn. Evan, Evelyn needed desperately to meet with Pastor Bill. She just kept saying, I've got to meet with the Pastor Bill before the funeral. I've got to meet with Pastor Bill before the funeral uh, because I was at the pastor's bedside while he was dying, and he breathed his last breath, and he gave me a song to sing at the end of the funeral at the graveside. He requested that, so... They hooked her up, Evelyn, with Pastor Bill, and she said, Pastor, uh, the, your, your friend there, Bob, he, uh, he uttered these last words to have Pastor Bill sing Jingle Bells at my funeral. And uh, Pastor Bill said, well, that's, that's crazy. Bob would have had never said that. I'm not going to sing Jingle Bells at the graveside. And she said, well, I'm just telling you, that's what he wanted. You know, that's what he said. So he's up there preaching the funeral, and he's kind of th thinking about that through the funeral, and he decided, well, I'm going to sing Jingle Bells at the graveside. That's what he wanted. So uh, it was his last dying request. So the day of the funeral came. The church, of course, was packed full of people, and uh, the funeral service went well. Everyone came to the graveside, and uh, Pastor... Bill was thinking, and he said, okay, here we go. So he was going to sing Jingle Bells. He tried to make it holy as he could, you know, and he, he kind of went, Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle all the way. He's singing through that and got through with the song, and he said, man, people were just avoiding me. They were so upset that I would sing Jingle Bells at the, at the graveside of uh, their pastor, you know, and when I had an opportunity to sing anything. So after all that was over, Evelyn came and said, that was such a nice funeral pastor, and I got to thinking, uh, I think Pastor Bob said sing Ring Those Golden Bells, not Jingle Bells. <laughs> so uh, sometimes we hear what wasn't said, uh, and, uh, of course, she let Pastor uh, Bill sit alone during the, uh, the visiting time instead of stepping up and taking the blame. But, but uh, sometimes we kind of hear things, and, and we say, well, is that really what was said? Is that really what I understand? A, a young boy was observed by a minister during the service. He was praying fervently. He, uh, he uh, kind of surprised the pastor to see him spend so much time in prayer. But every, every few minutes, he would... He would hear him say, Tokyo, 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 and then he would begin praying silently again. And uh, after the uh, boy finished praying, the pastor said, Son, I'm very pleased with you and see that you were praying so devoutly. 
but tell me, why did you keep saying Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo during your prayer? And the boy replied, well, see you, sir, I, I just finished taking my geography test in school, and I've been praying that the Lord would make Tokyo the capital of France. <laughs> uh, and I think sometimes we do that, too. Not only do we maybe hear what wasn't said, or maybe we begin to put words together what was said, but... I think too often we pray that God would change uh, to what we would have. In other words, we may not know the truth. The truth is Tokyo is not the capital of France. So if you were thinking, well, what was he praying for? Then that sounds like he got it right. No, he didn't get it right. And, and sometimes we, uh, we say, God, okay, here's what I need from you or here's what I want from you. And we ask God to change the truth. Now, we may not verbally say that. We may not really think about that. But sometimes we may say, well, this is what I believe. And it's not God's word. It's not the truth. But we still say, okay, God, this is, this is kind of what I want to happen or to take place. So uh, I think we, we too often listen to that. And, and this morning, God has plans. He has a plan for our future. He has plans for us. He has plans for us to... Uh, to prosper, he has plans for us to spend eternity in heaven, uh, and and I want us to look at the truth of God's word. And today in Scripture, uh, it's completely truthful, like all the rest of Scripture. But in John chapter fourteen, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Uh, he's having a discussion with them about the future, about his future, about their future, and he is trying to comfort his disciples. And here's what he says: If you're in John chapter fourteen, we're going to start in one. We hear this passage of Scripture a lot of times at funerals. He says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. For in my Father's house there are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I'll come back and take you to be with me also to be where I am. And you know the place, and you know where I'm going. So Jesus has been with his disciples for, uh, for three years now, teaching. He's been, they've been following him. They've been seeing miracles. They've been seeing all these things that he's doing. And he sits down, and he's telling his disciples, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm going to be placed on the cross. And, and tells Peter, he's gonna, he's gonna, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter says, I'd never do that. And... And so Jesus comforted his disciples. They're following him. They've given everything to follow Christ. And he says, I'm leaving, but you know where I'm going. And if I leave, surely I'll come back and I'll bring you where I am, that we may be there together. And uh, we talked some a uh, while back here about the, uh, the bridegroom and the father and how they would prepare a, a place for the uh, for the the. the the, the bride, and, and when the father said, okay, you've done enough, he would, he would tell the groom, go get your bride. And that's, Jesus has already taught about that. He's already told his disciples about that. They've heard the teaching. Uh, but what they wanted the truth to be was they wanted the truth to be Jesus set up his earthly kingdom because some of the disciples said, hey, we want to be your right-hand man. We want to sit right there with you when you're on your throne and and that was kind of their truth, and they were hearing Jesus teach and talk, but they just weren't buying into it. So as Jesus begins to teach, he says, hey, I'm going away, I'm going to prepare a place, I'm going to come back. He's already told them that the church, the new, the new covenant, the New Testament, the age of grace, that you're going to be the bride of Christ, and, and Jesus Christ is the bridegroom, and he said, I'm going to come back. He's taught them all these things, and... He says, remember, I'm going to prepare a place, and if I prepare a place, I'm going to come back that we may be together, and you know where I'm going. And then Thomas speaks up and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, how can we know the way to get there? And Jesus answered Thomas and said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. That's what he answered Thomas with there. And uh, he went on and said, If you really knew me, then you would know my Father as well. He's talking to his disciples. He said, Thomas, if, 
if you really knew who I was, if you really understood all the things I've taught you, then you would already know the Father, the Father God. And from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And, of course, Jesus is referring to himself. And then Philip, in verse 8, says, well, then show us the Father, and that'll be enough. That's all we want. You could go on and read that passage of Scripture if you have your Bibles. We're going to stop there, and, and we're going to talk about some truths that Jesus gave his disciples this morning. And I hope you'll follow along and listen and, and to what God has to say. He gives them several truths in this passage of Scripture. And here's the first. Jesus promises a better future. In, in verse 2 through 4, he says, Hey, my, my father's house, there's many rooms. I'm going, I'm, I'm building a place for you to come. And, of course, we know if we go and study that the Bible teaches there's going to be a day, there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and uh, God is going to dwell among men. That's the earth that we live on, I believe, that the Bible teaches that. That's just not my opinion. Uh, I believe that this earth will be destroyed, Satan will be destroyed. We know all of that from Revelation. And God is going to create a new heaven, a new earth, and we will be where he's at. So that's what, that's what Jesus is comforting his disciples with, that, hey, there's going to be a day that sin is going to be gone. It's going to be like God intended it in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It's going to be a perfect place. We'll be in God's presence. He will be in our presence. We're already in that presence of God. But there, he will literally walk on earth in heaven, and we'll be there with him, and, and we could spend the rest of the day talking about that. But he gives us comfort. Uh, I was thinking about the world we live in today. I think everybody here, to a certain extent, would agree. We live in a fallen world. We, I, I listen, we have absentee fathers. In some cases, we have absentee mothers and fathers. There's abusive spouses. There's abusive parents. There's perverted sexual desires or corrupt politicians, not to mention Christianity, and Christianity is under attack <clears throat> like it's never been before. I think y'all probably caught this, and I'm not, I'm not being political with this. I'm giving you the news, which I hate the news. Y'all know that. But uh, last week, Resurrection Sunday, that Sunday that's, the, uh, that's really the, the, the highest, holiest day that, that Christians celebrate. I mean, we celebrate Christmas, and we, uh, we celebrate Easter, the Resurrection Sunday, but really, when it comes to, to the Resurrection Sunday, it's for Christianity, that's our rock that we build our faith on. That's the, the foundation of Christianity, and so if you follow along in the news that day, the, uh, our government administration decided to name Easter Sunday as Transgender Day of Visibility on Easter Sunday. I'm sure y'all have heard about the backlash uh, that he got. Here's the thing that was interesting to me is, is even one of the more famous transgenders, uh, if there's such thing as a famous transgender, said, that's not a good idea. <laughs> he or she, whatever you want to say, well, I'll just say he said that, uh, and he buys into that theory, you know. So uh, he used to be a tennis player. I won't, I won't give his name or anything, but uh, he said, that's not a good idea. In New Orleans on Easter Sunday, they have the official gay Easter parade, and they plan it on Easter Sunday, and they've done that since the year 2000. We live in a sick, decaying world. And Jesus says, hey, there's a better future ahead. There's something to look forward to ahead. I just touched the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you could think about uh, the, the things you deal with on a daily basis, sickness and pain and, and hurt and all the things we have to deal with. All of those are not necessarily a result of your sin, but because we live in a sinful, fallen world that fell in the Garden of Eden. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. We live in that place today. The disciples lived in that place. Christianity was under attack like never before, maybe uh, as bad or worse than it is even today because there was many put to death. There's still those put to death in other countries for their Christian belief, but they would have understand this. So, so Christ is saying, hey, there's a better future. There's a better place. He gives us that promise, and uh, Y'all may, may have heard of Billy Graham. Most of us have heard of Billy Graham. He's getting more and more out of people's minds as, as we get older and older. But 
Uh, he said the disciples would prepare for the future through him. Uh, Billy Graham told this story about himself. He says early in his ministry, he arrived in a small town. He was supposed to preach a sermon. He needed to mail a letter, uh, so he asked his young boy where the post office was, and the boy told Mr. Graham, and he thanked him and said to the little boy, are you going to come to church tonight? If you'll come, I'll tell you how you can get to heaven. And the little boy thought about it a moment and said, no, sir, but thank you. I don't think I'll be there. You can't even get to the post office. <laughs> and uh, that's a true story. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we have a better future, but we don't understand how to get there. So the second truth that Christ taught was this. Here's the way to heaven. Here's the way we get to heaven. How do we get to heaven? This is old information, but I thought it was interesting. In 1997, there was a survey taken by the U.S. News and World Report, and here was the question, who do you think is most likely to get into heaven? Now, I don't know if they had names listed. I don't know if people came up with this on their own. I'm not sure uh, what the criteria was for the report, but here's how they answered. Who do you think is most likely to get to heaven? Mother Teresa had 79% thought she was the most likely. Oprah Renfrey had 66%. She was the most likely. Michael Jordan, 65%. I guess God likes basketball really well because he was right up there with, uh, with Oprah and, uh, and Mother Teresa. Colin Powell, some of y'all remember him, 61%. Then Dennis Rodman, he really fell off. He got down to 28%. Uh, and then O.J. Simpson, of course, during that time, a lot was going on in O.J.'s life. He dropped down to 19%. So the person that completed the survey answered the survey this way. He worked for U.S. News World and Report. He said this after he read the answers there, and that wasn't all of them. He says, one thing I know for sure uh, I know there's one person that they didn't mention that has a better chance to get to heaven than all of them, and that's me. <laughs> so he had this confidence that, hey, I've got a better chance than anybody that was listed to get to heaven. You know what? We, it's not a chance. It's not, a, it's not something that we can hope so and, and think, boy, I, maybe I've got a good chance and put some title behind that. We're going to look at the truth of that. It causes me to wonder how they rated these chances. But there's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the real story is told of a man who was on his way to the airport. He had a plane to catch, and some of you men may have been here before. He came to an intersection, and his wife told him we needed to turn left uh, to get to the airport. Have you all seen any, seen any of that? Uh, since I got married, I have a little helper to help me drive, you know. It's pretty funny, and it's pretty true. Uh, he said, she even tells me when the light's green, you know, and uh, he says, thanks, Cupcake, I'd have never figured that one out, you know, that the light turned green, but sure enough, she said, you need to turn left. The road was a narrow little road. It was a road that kind of led off the main path, but he liked the bigger road. He said, I decided to go on, stay to the right, because there was some beauty of nature all around. The, the route was much more scenic. Uh, so he, he said, no, I'm going to go to the right. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man. So there he went. He takes off. Time was kind of getting away, and he had this little voice, not his wife, kept saying, you better turn around, go back to that other road. He said, I didn't do that because I didn't want to feel like an idiot. You know, I, and, and the Bible says pride. You know, men are filled with pride. The more I understand God's word and the more I understand pride, I think that's why a lot of people never accept Christ. The pride won't allow them. They, they, they feel like I would look like an idiot or I would look like uh, my life has been a joke or I've been living a lie. That's Satan putting pride in our life. But he said, because of pride and stubbornness, I just kept on taking the scenic road. He said, sure enough, I did get to the airport. I raced in to board the plane only to hear the gates have closed, boarding has been shut, and the doors are locked, and the plane is leaving, and you've been left behind. Now, he told this as a story. He says, I was late because I made the wrong choice, and the plane's not coming back. 
And, and sometimes we get the idea that, hey, God, I'm going to live this way. I'm going to go ahead and go to heaven because I've done these things. Yeah, I didn't take the right road. I didn't take the right path. But, but God, you're going to let me into heaven anyway. We hear things that are not there. We, we say, God, change the circumstances, change the truth. But here's the thing. The truth never changes. So Jesus said this, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, no one comes to the Father except through baptism and giving, living a good life, helping others, and taking care of those you, you, you love. That's what we like, isn't it? No one comes to the Father unless you baptize, live a good life, help others, give, take care. Of. Jesus didn't say that. Man puts all of those things with salvation. You know what? Salvation is a free gift of God. Most people want to pay for something. So when it comes to uh, our sins, we say, well, God is surely going to require a payment for our sins. He did require a payment. He required the blood of a sacrifice. And you know who made it? Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to pay your price. He went to a cross. He paid the price of death. He paid the price for sin. He died, was buried, and was resurrected. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the only way to heaven. Now, you may leave here today and say, hey, uh, I went to church, and, and those Baptists believe this. I don't believe that way because I'm a Baptist. I believe that way because that's what Jesus' word said. It's not an opinion. It's not a thought. It's not something that you have to take twist around in Scripture. It's God's own word. Jesus answered to Thomas, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And incidentally, where he said, I am, you remember in the Old Testament when... Uh, when they were trying to get Pharaoh was uh, going to let the children go, and, and, uh, and Moses said, who am I going to tell them sent me? And, and God said, T tell them, I am has sent you. You know, in the, in the, the, the Jews would not even use that word, I am, because they recognized that was the glory of God. That was God himself. They wouldn't take that in vain. So when Jesus says, I am... He's referring to God the Father. He's referring to himself who are one and the same. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. So in today's perverse world, there are people that say there's many ways to God. You may say, well, I kind of believe that. Well, that's not the truth. Can you handle the truth? The truth is not because of the church win. The truth is because God's word says, I am the truth. I don't want to shoot some of y'all's idols down. I don't think you idolize this guy, but I really like Steve Harvey. He's funny. Family feud, you know, he comes up with some funny things. Listen to what Steve Harvey said. There's no one way to heaven or to paradise. Now listen, there's no one way to heaven or paradise. It's like a TV where there's over 800 channels on cable and they're all entertaining. So I'm pretty sure to get to heaven, there's got to be a lot more than one route just because somebody else watches a different channel than you watch, you're all still being under, uh, entertained. So just because I watch something different than you watch, we're still all going to heaven. Well, that's somebody's opinion, and it's not the truth. Matter of fact, it's a lie, because if it's not the truth, it's going against God's word. So he says there's not just one way to heaven. It's just like 8,000 8, TV channels, 800 TV channels. I may watch this channel. You may watch that channel. We're all going to end up with the same news program. Well, that's not true. So, so that's what he said. Of course, okra, you all know what okra, she, she has all kinds of different ideals. One of the mistakes people make, this is her quote. One of the mistakes people make is believing that there's only one way to heaven. That's a mistake that we make. In her opinion, I made a mistake this morning in my message. We don't accept that there are diverse ways of living in this world, but there's millions of ways to live in this world and to see the what you call God. So to see what you call God. She said she may call it the light. She may call it by a different name, 
But if she gets there by a different path, it doesn't matter if she's never called him God along the way or not. It doesn't matter. There couldn't possibly be just one way to heaven. Now, that's, that's, from, that's from the nuts in Hollywood, okay? No, no uh, present company excuse, excuse, of course. So Now, that's not just from the external in the church that's crept in now. I've, I've told you all about this guy over and over again, you know, Joel Osteen. Sets down on national television and says, who am I to say there's not more than one way to heaven? He's a preacher of the gospel. And he says, who, could I, who am I to say that God doesn't have many plans? I've already addressed that before. He's, you're, you claim to be one of God's servants. You, you, you are nobody to say that. God's word says that. You don't have to say it. I don't have to say it. God's word already says this. And as I said, it's not a, a Baptist church thing. They believe this way or that way. We believe it because Jesus said so. If there were many ways to go to heaven, why would God have sent his son at all? Think about this. Why would... Why would he have sent his son to die, to, to live a life of false accusations, to, to be tortured, to be beaten, to die on a cross? Why would, why would he send his son to do that? Because if, if there were many ways to God, then, then the blood of Christ is equal to yoga or karma or reincarnation or, or let me go back, David Koresh, you know, he said, I'm God, I'm the way to get to heaven Jim Jones, some of y'all have not even ever heard of him. Jim Jones was, had the cult, and he said, hey, come with me, and we're going we're gonna to go to heaven. There was another guy in Garland several years ago that, that said, we're going to catch the comet that crossed Garland, you know, and we're going to ride to heaven on it. I mean, so the blood of Jesus would be the same as all of those things. Hey, that's just another path to heaven. Why would God send his son to go through the hell on earth that he went through if there was another way to get to heaven? Somebody had to meet the payment of price, and that's the last thing. Here's the truth, admitting the truth. John 14, we're going to go down to verse 17 now, and it says this, The spirit of truth the world does not accept because it neither, neither sees him or knows him, but you know him because he lives in you and he will walk with you, he will be in you. So he's talking again to his disciples. He said, the world doesn't know the spirit of truth. You know how we know Jesus Christ is who he is? Because of his spirit, God's spirit, comes and woos us, calls us to himself. When we begin to study God's word, when we begin to understand God's word, then the Holy Spirit begins to teach us. Uh, I said in one of our Sunday school lessons, you know, there's, there's many, many men have set out to disprove the Bible. And nearly without exception, every one of them has become a Christian because the more they study and, and the more they dig to disprove, the more they compare history and the Bible, they realize that's God's true words. So, so the more people try to, to disprove the Scripture, then the more the Scripture brings us to Christ and the Spirit is here. So the truth is, and this is where we're going to close, we are all sinners. The, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's mark. Now, here's the thing. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. You may say, well, that don't even make sense. I want you to really think about that. I closed up shop here. I need to open it back up. If you're following along in your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And, and here's what I mean by that. You're not a sinner because you sinned at some point in your life. You sin because you are a sinner from birth. I talked about this last week, matter of fact. If you're in Romans chapter 5, I, I'm going to run through this pretty quick. Listen to what it says. Therefore, this is Romans chapter 5, verse, four, uh, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death, entered the world through one man. And this is the way death came to all men because all have sinned. Uh, for before the law was given, sin was in this world. All right, here's for y'all. If you don't answer, that's fine. Who is the one man death entered the world through? Adam, okay? Because of Adam, sin entered the world. Adam and Eve. 
All right, now jump down if you're following along your scripture to verse 15. I just don't want to read all these for time-wise. For if many died by the trespasses or by the sins of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of them through one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Now, I want to, I want to go on and read the rest of scripture, and then we'll put it all together. Verse 18, drop down to verse 18. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was a condemnation for all men... Hear what that's saying? By one sin, Adam, it was a condemnation, condemnation for all men. I'll explain that in just a minute. So also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. So here's what Paul is saying in Romans. He's saying that one man, Adam, of course Eve there's with him, sinned, and, and when that happened... Sin entered man. It entered his nature. I've said this many, many times from up here. Adam is your relative, okay? If you go back to, what's that, what's one of them things that you can get your ancestry or whatever? If they could literally go back to the beginning of time, you know who the first person on your tree would be? Adam. Even if your tree don't branch anywhere, Adam would be the very top of it, and you, and you drop down to where you are. So, so we are all related to Adam, and that's what Romans telling us. And because of that, we inherited a sinful nature from Adam. So we don't sin. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we inherited a sinful nature. So when we sit here today and we begin to think to ourselves, well, I'm not that bad, Jake. You don't understand. I've not really done these things. I've kind of paid the price. I've kind of balanced the scales out. And, and God just, Tokyo, 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 look at all I've done. So change that truth a little bit because, God, I've been a pretty good person. Okay, the Bible says if any person says where they're without sin, that they're a liar and they call God a liar. But just for the sake of an illustration... Just say you've never sinned. And I'll say, okay, this morning, you've never sinned? That's amazing. I sinned yesterday. I sinned this morning, I imagine. I mean, but okay, you've never sinned. And you would say, okay, I've never sinned, so why do I need Christ? Whether you sinned or not, you have a sinful nature living within you. You inherited it from Adam, and that's what Paul is teaching it, just as condemnation, just as death entered through one man, so one act of righteousness, and that word righteousness means a right relationship with God the Father, and justification, that word means just as if I'd never sinned, so we have an open relationship with God the Father, just like we've never sinned because of what Jesus Christ done. So when we look at that, that's the truth of God's word. When Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, that's what we understand from that truth. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short. We've all failed because we inherited a sinful nature. Because of that, sin entered the world, but Jesus Christ came. He defeated sin. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. He defeated the grave. He was risen again. And he says this, here is a free gift for you. The Bible uses a term like putting a money into your account. You, well, I'll be a Christian if you're going to put some money in my account. No, thank you, a spiritual account. When we accept Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches that he places in our account his death, his blood, his resurrection. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sinful nature. He sees a new nature that we received in Jesus Christ, and in that new nature, we have life, and we have a promise of better days. Remember, he told his disciples, there's better times coming. But there's a free gift, and we don't have time this morning, but that death that Jesus is talking about, that Scripture's talking about, is spiritual separation from God. That's death. The Bible says we were dead in our sins. We were dead in our transgressions. In Colossians 2.13, it says, but we are made alive again in Christ. 
So to God, before we accept Christ, we are dead. When we accept Jesus Christ, we are made alive again in Christ, through Christ. So here's the truth. If you've never accepted Christ, you're dead in your sin. That's what the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. 1 through 3. Listen to what the Bible says also. Yet while we were still sinners, yet while we were still dead, Jesus Christ died for us. In Romans 5, 8, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning and Here's the key. Believing is not enough. You may say, Jake, I believe every word you said this morning. You may say, well, Jake, I've never even heard that, but it's interesting. The Bible says even demons believe, and they shudder. That means they shake when they think about it. The difference is this. When we say, Lord, I realize that I am a sinner, there's nothing I can do to fix myself, but I want to ask your forgiveness. I want to claim your blood. I want to claim your death. I want you to come into my heart. You know, there's not going to be a bunch of fireworks go off and, and, and golden harps playing. They may. It never, never have. I've never seen that happen, but it could, I guess. But here's the thing. Jesus says at that point, he places... He clothes us. He puts clothes of righteousness on us that when God looks at us, he looks at us through the blood of Jesus and sees us as a right relationship made alive in Christ. The invitation is this. Have you ever accepted Christ? Oh, I can't do that. People think I was a Christian years ago. Well, that's that pride of life. I, boy, that would be embarrassing. That's the pride of life. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm life. If you're relying on anything other than Jesus Christ to get to heaven, more than believing, but confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, for it's with our mouth we confess and are justified, and so with our hearts we believe and we're saved. Father, I pray this morning that as your spirit moves among your people, Lord, I pray that we'd respond to the wooing and the calling of your Word, the calling of your spirit, the wooing of your spirit, the leading of your spirit, Lord. I pray, Father, each one of us here would understand your word and understand that we're accountable for our sin. There's nothing we can do except accept the blood of Jesus for salvation, Lord. Pray that we'd know today as we baptize in just a moment that that picture that we'll see is, is an old nature dying and being buried and being raised to walk in a new nature with Christ. Lord, I pray this morning your spirit move freely in this place, and I pray this in the name of Jesus.